Welcome back to the BJJ Brick Podcast. This is episode 250. I'm Tim Sled, and this is my friend, Roly Delgado. Hey, hey. How you guys doing? This is Joe Thomas. I'm here with uh, Roly and Tim and my good buddy Byron and my good buddy Gary. Episode 250. That's right. We are uh, really excited for this episode. Uh, we just had an amazing weekend and uh, fortunate enough to have both Roly and Tim in the kind of studio we're all here together. This has been, this is really neat. Even though this is episode 250, this is the first time Joe, Byron, and I have been together on a podcast in the same room ever. And then we have two superstars, Tim and Rolly. Like, how can it get any better than that? Oh, man, it's my pleasure to be here. I can't add any value in it, not be in it, and it not be rated R. So it's as good as it can go. <laughs> hey, I can tell you, you have added a ton of value this weekend to my game. You know, so you also, Tim. So, you know, the value is is going to pay dividends for me for the next couple of years with the stuff I learned today so, or learned this weekend. We had the BJJ Brick Summer Camp for this weekend. So, Byron, tell us a little bit about the summer camp. Yeah, it was really done by uh, Jake Fox. Put this whole thing together, and uh, he he's like, it would be cool to do a event and find uh, people who have been on the podcast, bring them in and train. And the list of names is pretty long. 250 episodes, we've had many interviews and uh, been wanting to meet Tim Sled for years. And uh, Roly Delgado is a, kind of a staple to, to bring it into Wichita. So two perfect people to come in and, and teach uh, some of their systems and some of their game. Uh, to the people here. And we had people coming in from uh, Pennsylvania. We had a guy here from California. Uh, and, of course, the neighboring states uh, basically had a, we had a pretty good turnout. I was happy. Uh, I don't know if we had we had around 35 today, and I don't know if we had about that yesterday as well. Uh, a lot of jiu-jitsu this weekend. <laughs> what was your guys' uh, – Tim and Rolly, what was your guys' thoughts? At first it was great. To, to be honest, uh, originally I was a little hesitant to – to commit to it because I knew I was going to be gone for three days and I've, I've been so busy but I always have a good time here in Wichita and uh, I, I really enjoy, have enjoyed getting to meet everybody and Jake is a good friend of mine and I thought well you know I'm going to do it and I, I'm so glad that I did it was uh, it, it was just an absolutely awesome weekend for me um, it was a good break from the grind that I've been on lately and I, I got to be a student um, and uh did, did you know your uh, uh, lesson today? And then Tim's uh, seminar uh, was was amazing and very difficult to follow. Uh, not follow the seminar, but I had to teach after him. It was it was awesome. So um, that was good. You know, like um, I got some good training in. Um, but my takeaway from the weekend is just you know I just continue to meet great people in the sport, and it's just this. And, and I'm you know continuing continuing to strengthen. Um, my relationships with everybody here in Wichita and that's just what keeps me in jiu-jitsu I, I really love jiu-jitsu but um I have other hobbies outside of it but the thing about jiu-jitsu that's that is leaps and bounds uh above all my other interests is the community like it, there's just no comparison of all the things that I do jiu-jitsu is what brings me a ton of joy uh and brings me around a bunch of great people and I continue to just meet more and more great people it's it's hard to keep up with everybody you know it's like you're just drowning in awesome folks and um I rarely meet bad apples man it's like I'm, I'm meeting people because they're friends of friends and like you've interviewed Tim a few times and you were dying to get him out here and so like even though it's the first time you met him like you guys were still connected and it's like good people just keep finding good people and this this weekend just really reaffirmed that for me um and and that's why I've, I've been able to be in the sport for 20 years because of all the great people in it. That was long-winded enough, wasn't it? <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah, so um, this weekend for me has just been, um, I guess, an, uh, an excellent time for me to kind of refocus myself on instruction. Um, I've been fortunate enough to kind of have a break from running a school. I do teach classes multiple times a week, but it's not my, like, school, so I don't have to, I don't have all of the the, the burden of, of making sure that everybody's coming in paying the bills. I just walk in, teach class, walk out. Um, and uh, I think I might have grown a little bit complacent 
in my teaching. And so I got fired up to come out to see you guys. Um, you know, Byron and I have done several interviews together, and uh, you know, I, I think the world of the BJJ Brick podcast. And then when I heard that, um, uh, when Jake told me that he was he was trying to get Rolly on board, I was like, this is going to be great. I had very very high expectations, which is usually a dangerous thing, uh, but my expectations were exceeded. Uh, you know, meeting Rolly. Uh, learning from Roly, the stuff that he showed at this, uh, in his workshop, his seminar, immediately I was able to put it into practice. I've been I've been using it this weekend when I train gi and no gi, and it's an area where I'm a white belt. You know, um, he, uh, one of the things that Roly just mentioned was you know, sort of the relational as- aspect of of jujitsu, um, and one of the things I love about it is just like in every relationship, sort of paradigm that you have in life, whether it's work or um, school or jiu-jitsu, if you think you know everything, you're going to be sadly disappointed when you find out how much you didn't know and it's too late to fix it. And jiu-jitsu is a daily reminder, if you're doing it right, that you got a lot more to learn. And, you know, I've, I've done a straight ankle lock since 1998. I just never, I, the only time I started doing it right was today. Uh, because the details he showed, the methods of entry, uh, it's exactly what I needed. I'm a white belt at foot locks. I'm a white belt at straight ankle locks. And um, um, and so I've got room to grow there. And, you know, what a better – I couldn't find a better environment than this weekend because there were people from all sorts of different flags and geographies that came together. And so everybody was just really friendly and welcoming and hard rolls. Like I had some really fun and challenging roles, and um, it was it was a blast. You know, one thing that really stood out to me is just watching you two interact. Uh, from an outsider's point of view, I look at you two as role models for me. Somebody who, you know, I think is head and tails above the rest of us, and somebody that I want to get to your level. I want to emulate you guys. But what really surprised me is, first of all, I don't think you guys knew each other before you came in here. But I just loved how you guys were so into each other's seminar. Like you were just talking right now, Tim, about, you know, how much you learned from Roly. And I know Roly was the same way. And it just makes me realize, and you just mentioned again, Tim, there, but even at your levels, you guys never stop learning. It's you guys are going to pick each other's brains. Like the rest of us all went out to eat these two stayed and just trained with each other it's they're just picking brains they're just putting more tools in their tool bags as joe likes to say but that's what really impressed me and that's something that i think is what's made you guys so high level you guys are always open to learning from anybody and and like roly says here you know people aren't bad apples you're you're meeting great people and and just picking their brains and check you know learning from them well, listen, it's like this. I mean, in, in just about any other sport or hobby that you could get in, to be able to be on in the same arena with somebody who's competed at the level that Roly has competed, who's trained guys, who's a, a coach of the level that Roly is, you would pay thousands of bucks for that opportunity if it was even available. You know, like my professor, Professor Andre Galval, you know, he's like the Michael Jordan. If you go back to the like 90s basketball and you can't play, you can't shoot one on one with with Michael Jordan without you can't shoot. You can't go play golf with Tiger Woods or whoever's big at golf. You just can't do it. Right. You can't throw passes, catch with Peyton Manning. But the beautiful thing about jujitsu is, you know, I've known Ro- I know of Roly for a long time. I mean, I was at a tournament. I want to say it was like 2005 and I watched him compete and I was just like, man, that guy's really good, really tough. And so, yeah, when I, when I get to have contact with him, I get to be on the mat with him. I'm going to be a sponge to him. I've got so much to learn from him. And then to get rolled up by him as many times as I can in a weekend is bonus. Yeah. I, I, uh, and, and well, like the thing that I look for to, cause I have a really short attention span is clear, concise instruction. And so, like, he obviously, uh, Tim knows his uh, material really well. And so, like, he just was able to cover a lot of, like, really important principles. And then he tied them all to submissions in his seminar. So he covered a lot of ground in a short period of time. And so today we got to train together. And uh, I was able to, like, steal a little private lesson from him on the uh, the leg drags. Because that's the, the, you know, the guard passing is a system. And you're, you're using 
you you never it works best together like punches right punches and bunches and so you know you're, you're doing a lot of movements with passing the guard and the leg drag is the weakest part of my uh, passing sequences and so like I just asked them some questions and it was just like like just clear concise you know it's like with it, there's no debate there's no like talking your way through it he just like yeah this is it right here I do it like this all mechanically structurally sound so like in like 20 minutes of just like doing leg drag work that, that's with like the average jiu-jitsu coach it would take me an hour and a half to get there but just somebody just like delivers the information so yeah that was the opportunity today it was like once everybody went to eat lunch um that i knew that was my time to really pick his brain and um, get better you know and, and develop um that that side like that's what's going to help me is like like there was a couple things on the leg drag that i was just I was just missing. There's no other way to say it. Like, I think I know it, you know, but like you're swinging a wiffle ball bat or you're hitting in the big leagues. Like, yeah, you're swinging a bat. Like, yeah, you're, you're dragging the legs sort of. But um, now I have like some some clear, concise things to work on structurally. And the way that I'm going to get better at it is I'm going to teach it to my guys. That's how I drill is uh, I teach. And then um, so, yeah, like it, it's awesome. It was it was perfect. So the the weekend was just super cool i i can't believe like i was on the fence about doing it and and now i'm like like i hope like dude i'd love if they just brought us both back and you guys did the same exact camp and we just did different content you know like it would be so cool uh it was just a great weekend so i mean that's cool that you guys uh both enjoyed the weekend as well it feels like a lot of times when somebody does a seminar they come out they teach and, and you know, thank you for the business, and they're off. Yeah, but you could tell just the the connection between you guys, and the connection between you guys and the people taking the seminar was was really positive. And uh, I think that's an important thing. Now uh, we do have a quote of the week. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's uh, um, we're we're talking to uh, Kevin Junior. Uh, I'm Kevin. Um, ever since I was six years old, my father always told me. You know, if you can't find a good person in this world, be one. Uh, that's an interesting quote, and you know, I think about like a like a small town, and uh, it has one gym, one jujitsu gym, and that's it. You go in there, and it was kind of rough. It wasn't really the, the thing you were looking for, but you really wanted to do jujitsu. Well, the next person that comes in that's like you is going to have the same exact experience, unless you're there representing that side of jiu-jitsu for that person and so you know you could turn and, and, and be the person who's not that friendly and kind of abrasive and in it for themselves or you could be the person at that gym that kind of stands alone and is helping everybody and and, and being a, a super friendly and having a good time uh that attitude for the next person that comes in the gym and it'll help the whole gym but uh, you know the, the, that quote's not meant for jiu-jitsu but it does translate if if the gym that you're at uh, if there's a, a little bit of an issue with, with the way people are treating each other, it starts with you. And, and own that, and, uh, and that will help the gym. That's great advice. You know, Rolly was talking about uh, don't meet a lot of bad apples here in this sport. And, you know, I start thinking about that. It's if everybody just became that nice person, we're going to have less bad apples. Our, our goal is to grow jiu-jitsu, and we need to be welcoming, friendly, treat everybody to respect and courtesy that walks in that door. Uh, a lot of these people here at this uh, summer camp this, this weekend, I did not know. I didn't know Tim. I've met Rolly before. But I feel like I've made probably 15 new friends mm-hmm. that, you know, I've even talked about uh, uh, Tim that, you know, when I go back out east, maybe I can stop through mm-hmm. and uh, train at his academy. So I've met so many great people. It's going to open a lot of doors and, and uh, you know, we just treat each other respect and courtesy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, to speak on that, you know, obviously it starts with the leadership um, and it, you don't necessarily have a lot of control of that. And so you can control yourself and what you're saying is correct. Um, but I think a, a good way of looking at things, too, is if somebody seems standoffish or, um, you know, they're, they're not great to be around, whatever it is, it's it's always good to have some empathy because in, in my experience, most of the the closed doors, bridge burning, just... You know, when, when I have met somebody who didn't have a personality that I could really vibe with, 
you know, and, and this isn't to like throw stones. I'm not thinking of anybody in particular. It's not to throw stones or anything, but the, most of that comes from insecurity. It may be the business owner that's nervous. Um, and I can tell you, like, as a black belt, there's, there's uh, plenty of times that I'm insecure about my skill level. I mean, that's the truth. I would, that, that is 100% transparent. Um, there are times that I don't feel like I'm as good as I need to be. And uh, I, I, luckily, I deal with that in a productive way. And if it's unfortunately, some people deal with that by um, building walls. And so if you have somebody that's doing that, and that's not to say, oh, you're only doing that because you're insecure. But it just gives you some empathy to look at that person and go, oh, man, um, you know, like the, they don't realize they're being a, necessarily like a, a not awesome person. They're just doing what they think is in their best interest, you know, and they may be financially like in a tight spot and, they, and they're just nervous they're going to lose students if everybody cross trains with them or their students go hit this open mat. And so like you can actually have some some sympathy and empathy for those people. And if you if you look at it that way, I think you can find a way in for those people, you know, maybe a personal invite to something like, hey, man, like we haven't hit it off like uh, and hung out and you're like 30 miles from me. This is weird. Like, dude, let's go grab drinks and watch a stupid movie. You know, and if they don't take you up on it, so be it, you know, but that's going to lead to a, a, hey, like, let's work out, like, keep the students out of here. And I just think there's ways to build bridges if you really want to build a community and you won't be able to bring everybody in. And you won't be able to do it overnight. Something to keep in mind with this is cultures don't change quickly. So if you, like Byron said, you join a gym and it's not the vibe you're looking for and you want it to improve, it's going to be a long process and you just got to work at it daily. You know, and, and to... You know, I feel like, you know, I have the largest gym in Arkansas, and that's like saying you have the tallest building in Topeka, Kansas, right? Like, that <laughs> four stories, you know, like, um, but I feel like maybe like some people don't hit my open mats and stuff, and maybe it's a little, they're not outright told not to, but it's discouraged. I get it, you know, like if you're from a smaller gym, like you wouldn't necessarily want to take your guys and like send them to an open mat to a gym that's in the same neighborhood as you. Like, I don't fault anybody for that. That's not, that's totally reasonable. When I was getting started, like, Man, I had such an ego, you know, and there was times like if somebody else said like, oh, we're the best at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, I took it personally. Now I look at everybody's website and everybody claims to be the best and I don't take it personally. I'm above that, you know, but like, I, again, I think a lot of times like that perspective really comes with just some honesty about like where you've been because I've been there, you know, I've been like, like not necessarily like being rude to people or anything, but like you're a little closed off, but it, it's based on some t- sort of self-preservating need. And if we see it for what it really is, I think we can really get through to people. And once people uh, feel comfortable and let their guard down, I think that's when like real relationships can build. And that's what we're looking for in jiu-jitsu is to better ourselves. I talk about this with my students all the time. And I think that's the trick to um, keeping people engaged in jiu-jitsu is, is to somehow, you know, I talked a little bit about the mental game um, in my seminar, but somehow use jiu-jitsu as a platform to make your life better and if that's like I don't want to compete well why don't you want to compete well and then it it turns out that you're just really nervous you're going to let all your teammates down well that's not a good reason like if you're not willing to face that here that's going to manifest itself in other areas and if you're able to use jujitsu to overcome those things um, it will pay dividends outside you know off the mat and uh, I think that's the trick for what we're doing hey we're all getting older I mean look at this table right we're not nobody's competing at adult worlds you, you guys know. making fun of my age again? <laughs> <laughs> you're a good looking 50 though, man, right? You're, yeah. you're rocking it, training hard, in shape. Um, I hope that uh, I'm, you know, uh, at fi- like 50 is what, 14 years from, from now, man, I hope that my body's still holding up, you know, and um, starting jiu-jitsu later than me. A pay- As I'm walking around with a limp today. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. <laughs> I, I've been out all weekend. Oh, yeah, I know. Train. I know. I got 20-year-olds that are out with injuries, too. I just think that's what it is. That's what living is. Living is suffering. (laughs) Here's one of the things I think is really important, uh, because we're talking about bad apples and or the lack of bad apples in the sport and how to build. uh, Roy just did a great conversation on how to to build relationships between gyms and things like that. One of the things I think is, number one, Brazilian jiu-jitsu is, according to, I think, who was it, Joe Rogan said it's a great douchebag filter. Um, But I think there's another level that leadership uh, within a gym needs to have their eyeballs on that. Uh, for me, it's big. You know, I, do, I, am, I am first and foremost a leader in every gym that I walk into, whether I'm assigned that role or not. 
Um, you know, when I came in this weekend, there was a certain way I was going to hold myself, you know, so that everybody, you know, um, I got the most out of the experience in a safe manner, but in a manner that was, you know, as organized and that I could help as possible. If I'm in a, if, if when I'm at home, you know, if somebody come somebody new comes in, the first person they have contact with is going to be with me and I get to launch sort of what the culture is. And um uh with female students in in the gym, you know, I'm I'm Maybe this is a little chauvinistic, but I keep my eye out on them, making sure that they're being rolled with well, fairly, with the right guys, that have the right motivations. Um, you know, if they're getting treated brutally and it's not deserved and not called for, then I then I get to have the next role. You know, I get to be involved in that, and I, I act as a filtration system. You know, if I have a young guy or an old guy, you know, either either spectrum. I got a 14 year old that comes in to train, or I've got a 62 year old that comes in to train. I'm going to protect those guys. I'm going to watch out for them because the culture in my gyms needs to be one of uh, we're all family. So these are brothers and sisters, or these are elders when we're in front of each other, um, and we're here to improve ourselves in some way, shape, or form. So instructors, I think, have a have a an obligation to keep an eye on who who's around. And what their vibe is, and then I think you get to assign you get to assign what level of any one of those vibes you want. You know, if you're if you're in a gym where swearing's not allowed, that's your your prerogative. A lot of gyms will allow for that, and that's cool too. But if it's your prerogative that that isn't allowed, then you can't like you can't be willy nilly with it. You got to say that's a rule here. And the guy down the street who I know really well, maybe he's got he allows for that, you know. Or um, you know, if if going knee in the eye socket. Uh, is is looked down upon in your gym. Um, you know, if, if you're not allowed to do certain techniques, you need to make those rules known. You need to have a filtration system up on the front end, and everybody just needs to have the right expectation. I feel people get most hurt by discipline within a gym because they don't know the rules or they don't see the rules being applied fairly. And so I, I'm just real clear on my communication you know, number one by example. Number two by, this is what it is. Uh, if we're wearing it, if we're wearing the kimono and we're training, you're not going to attack a heel hook um, in my in my gym when you walk through my doors. Those are known, and I've gotten grief from other from visiting people about that. Uh, and I'm just like, I'm going to protect my students. You know, um, people from another school walk in, and I know that they are heavy on heel hooks and whatnot. I just say, hey, out of the gate. Uh, no heel hooks, especially on anybody below like a purple belt or a blue belt here, please. And that's just our rule for being there. So you set a filtration. You set the culture, like you said. You don't build it overnight, but the leadership gets to set the tone and then have sort of known and consistent discipline. Um, and your, your your culture will develop itself. One of the things uh, 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 Roly said is uh, I don't I can't remember when he said it. Maybe it was yesterday or today. It's all kind of blending together for me. But um, he's the captain of his ship, right? And so he gets to steer his ship. But jujitsu is an ocean, okay? And and there's going to be shifts and waves. And he's steering his ship. But you know the wave might be that uh, guys in his school want to know, you know, how to do some 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 open guard uh, stuff that he may not be versed in. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't like fight the waves. He just steers the ship. He's got a student, uh, he, um, uh, he's mentioned his name that, that does this stuff really well. So he, he gives, he gives that assignment to that guy. And so he creates the culture because uh, to use the same sort of analogy, you know, the rising tide raises all ships. So if he, if he holds back and says, Brown belt, you can't speak in class. You know, if he sets the culture where I'm, I'm the, I'm there's leader worship here. I'm, I'm the big dog, and and you don't get to talk. Well, he's not. Rolly's not going to get any better. It's going to slow down his progress because he needs his students, and he I know because of what I've heard him talk about. He loves that he's got students that are always nipping at his heels and catching him regularly because he's training right. He's making himself vulnerable, um, and. There's the culture, you know. I think if you walk in, um, and and your head instructor has some sort of design in his program where you need to have this overwhelming awe of him, he's going to fail. That instructor is going to fail himself. He's going to fail the students, and the program's going to fizzle. I've seen it happen. Uh, real quick, 
real quick, uh, did you say nipping at his heels because it's rolly? Yeah, that's such a fun. Yeah, it's just so fun intended. He, intended he on said that. nipping at my heels, then he said like catching. I was because I was thinking like no, like you know I have like uh, a squad of purple belts right now, and they you know they each have unique uh, and brown belts as well, but like uh, that they each have like a unique thing that they give me fits with and uh i get tapped out in my gym and and i always talk about that with people like they always say like oh well if your students are beating you you're a great instructor and i'm like yeah that's that's true there's there's some pride in that but there's it also still bothers you as a grappler you know because um the the unfortunate thing about jiu-jitsu is the guy that's training under you is getting better much faster than you got better so even though you've been doing it 20 years you've filtered everything for them and you've streamlined it for them and you've basically taught them your jiu-jitsu we all teach the things we're good at and you should it's the things you know really well so like i get bested by my guys and i was i was making a joke with uh uh some of you guys the other day or tim i I can't remember who i was in the conversation but uh, it's a compliment when my students beat me in a round and we, I say, we're going to run it back. Cause it's, it's me saying like, you got the best of me and I, you know, my ego needs another go at you. So it's like, it's not like I'm going to make it weird and I'm going to try to punish you. I am obviously going to be going a hundred percent, you know, because we're, we're, it's hard training. You just beat me. Uh, but we're running it back and then it's like, okay, you know, and that develops that mental toughness. They see that in me. Like, I'm not going to like run from you. I'm going to run at you. And I think that's like a cool thing. And it's so much easier like that to not put yourself on a pedestal and to be vulnerable and transparent. Cause you, if you don't put yourself on a podium, you don't have anything to fall from and you're just right there with your guys. And, and, and that goes back to that ship uh, deal. And, um, you know, I'm just, I, uh, what I says, I'm just steering the ship, man. Like, uh, the, we're, we're all in this journey together. I'm far from being the, the end all be all of instruction. And so we're just doing it together. We're getting, but wait, when I was training Hillary, man, she, I taught her almost everything I knew, you know, and she was like a high level blue or purple by then. Like at the time, like, you know, I was just teaching her everything I knew and we grew together and that was so cool. Like she would cross train everywhere. She'd come back. She would be. I mean, it, 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 it's embarrassing to think about all the stuff I didn't know when, when we were coming up. But it worked. We grew together. And, like, till this day, she's my biggest pit bull. Like, if you even, like, look at me crossways, like, Hillary Williams would be down your throat. Like, it's, like, a full frontal assault. Like, she's a straight pit bull. But we grew together. And, and we're still growing together, you know, the whole team. And, obviously, I think that's the, the vibe what we're, we're getting on this podcast is, um, like, we're, we're having fun growing together and, and – uh, Sometimes, like you got to eat some humble pie in the process. You don't you don't get to be the man every day in jujitsu. Well, I've noticed Byron keeps telling me uh, he wants to run it back because I've gotten so much better at podcasting than him. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, Roly and Tim have us beat, though. This is probably the best discussion we've had on a simple <laughs> quote. <Yeah>. So <laughs> awesome, guys. Uh, okay, to derail things a little bit we do have a portion of the show that we like to bring in kind of an off the mat topic and then we drag it back onto the mats and discuss it and it typically involves kind of a story in one of our lives and it was about a week and a half ago i'm eating dinner at a at a small restaurant with my wife and we get uh pizza we put it on the table we sit down start eating and we don't have napkins no big deal. I get up and get napkins. I come back and I sit down and she's sitting at the, like the booth side of the table, like the bar. And I have like a little tiny chair and I go, I grab the table and I pull myself to the table to slide in. But really what I did was I moved the entire table five inches towards my lap. And uh, that's away from her five inches. She looks at me like, what are you doing? <laughs> and I, oh, sorry. And then I immediately push it back, but I push it back way too far. And now it's like on her lap. And she's, cause she, she's right over there. I mean, she, this, she experienced this whole thing. I told her I was going to tell the story. Um, and so now I, I pulled it too far towards me, pushed it way too far on top of, of her lap. And uh, the whole time I want my chair to move, not the table. And so I pull it one more time back towards me, and it was, again, too far towards myself. At, this, at that like, exact moment, she's holding a slice of pizza, and it drips sauce onto her lap, which should have landed on her plate. And uh, we have a couple of, like any relationship, you have some uh, like ongoing jokes that you kind of you know, have going on. And one of mine is that I spill food on myself a lot. 
Because anytime I, I, I think I'm slightly above average, but I make a big deal out of it and I make fun of myself <laughs> when it happens. Oh, look, it happens again. I've got another chocolate stain or, or whatever. But uh, when it hit her lap. Byron, you sure that's chocolate? <laughs> it's on the front of his shirt, Gary. <laughs> that's how he knows it's chocolate. Gary's question if it's chocolate or not. <laughs> but uh, but now I've, I've managed to spill food on her lap that was in her hand, and it's, it's my doing, which is that's hilarious. Evolving. It's hilarious, right? <laughs> so uh, not that funny to her at the time because <laughs> she, she had a long day to wear those clothes. All this being said, you know, to drag it back on the mats... She married me. That's who she has. She knows what she's getting. She knows that guy that's going to be fairly clumsy at dinner is going to spill some things. Not a surprise. Like, yeah, it happened to you now because of me. Same thing with jiu-jitsu. Like, you've come in and your wrist is a little bit banged up or you've got a broken rib. Look at your, your teammates, your classmates. You know what you're going to get from each one of them yeah, if you know them well enough. And you can kind of say, today I'm going to roll with these three people and up, or today I'm going to avoid these people because even if I tell them I'm, I'm damaged goods today, in a minute they're going to totally forget about that and they're going to be make me regret I got on the mats. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, she married me, so she's stuck with me and she's going to have spilled food on her occasionally. But she knows what she's getting when she goes out to dinner with me. <laughs> she's giving me a look. You're just lucky you live in a state where divorce is not allowed, apparently. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting that the know what you're going to get like the way that I um, think about that in terms of jiu-jitsu is like when you um, have an instructor or a coach like you, you can't have everything you know if you want a guy that's going to be there every day teaching classes well he's um, rarely going to be like a, an active world champion because if you want to go train with the active world champion they're doing seminars every weekend long weekends they're hitting a ton of tournaments they're on the road everybody's pulling at them you can't have that guy holding your hand every day. It's, you're asking for two things that are very difficult to find. Um, so you find a guy that's in the gym all the time, uh, very good at jiu-jitsu, but you know, obviously he's not out every weekend doing every major tournament and all these seminars and stuff. So you, you know, my students, the, the joke is always, I'm sorry about the tips, guys. Like um, somebody will go from having one tip to four tips, and two months later being a blue belt. You know, like because I just I'm not very structured and organized with my um, grading. Everything is like when it feels right for me. When I feel like that that person um, needs to get the next rank, and so like yeah, like there's a lot of benefits to training with me. I care about you. I'm uh, I'm pretty selfish that I want everybody to be good for my own ego. I love being a good coach, but that plays real well for my students because I'm vested in making them as good as they can possibly be. On the flip side, if like you need a stripe every four months because you've been killing it and that's what that's what drives you, like you know what you're getting with me. I'm not gonna be on the ball. I'm not gonna be there on the eighth month with the second stripe. You know, it's just you know, that's just one of the areas um and we're you know that that I'm not good at. So you know what you're gonna get. That's kind of what I was thinking um with my uh my analogy to jiu jitsu. What, well what's yours, Tim? Well, so like picking training partners is is um, really tough in the white and blue belt phase, I think, because you don't know really what to expect and you don't know what's the right feel and the wrong feel. I know as a as a black belt now, I know how to pick my training partners. Um, you know, if there, there's days where I want I want to pick the the lions in the room, you know, um, because I want a hard rule. Uh, there's days when I I want to I want to go with somebody who's flexible and there's going to be a lot of playing going on. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think, it, I think it's really important that the, there be the freedom that what, like Byron said, uh, if you, if you don't want to, if you want to pick three people to roll, you should be allowed to roll with those three people. Now I think coaches, uh, need to be, need to be able to push people in out of their comfort zone because uh, we all have our comfort zone. One of the things I say is that the Brazilian jiu-jitsu mats, they're, they're sort of sacred because before you step on the Brazilian jiu-jitsu mat out in the parking lot or in the changing room, you can claim to be whatever you want to claim to be. You can claim your belt is, is super legit. You can do anything you want. You can claim you're a, a fighter or a tournament champion or anything like that. But when you step on the mat, you slap hands, bump fists, the truth comes out, right? You are what you really are. 
another place that that tr- works the exact same way on the mats that I think makes them a sacred zone is that um, just about everybody who's training finds that they have something they're good at and then they have areas that they're not so good at. I call those the shadows. And a lot of people avoid the shadows. They don't shine light into the shadows. And especially when it's time to train, they tend to want to roll in the light, you know, go to people where they can play their game and avoid somebody who exposes their shadows. They can't escape the back. They can't escape cross-eyed bottom or whatever it may be. And I think a coach sometimes has to be able to say, hey, I noticed you haven't, you haven't, rolled, with, uh, you haven't rolled with Mick in a long time. Why don't you go put a roll in with Mick? Oh, okay, good. And then, but I think a good coach also then debriefs with him and says, "All right, so you know, what you, I saw you pick these two people. I stuck you with Mick. Tell me, tell me about all of your roles. Uh, what can you learn from this? Everybody who I rolled with this weekend, I asked them, you know, what were your takeaways? What did you notice? What did you think about from our role? Uh, because I'm a big fan of being present in your and, and being purposeful in your training." Um, we get a limited number of opportunities to smack hands and bump fists. Our lives are finite. We're only on these mats for a certain amount of time. You can have a lot of fun doing it, which is fantastic. But ultimately, we should be, as Rolly said, trying to improve ourselves. So we need to be present for each role. You know, um, whether you're a black belt rolling with a white belt or a white belt rolling with a white belt, uh, every role, you should say, this frustrated the, 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 the expectation I had of this movement, or, man, I re- this was actually easier than what I expected it to be. Uh, why? Um, you know, and um, so I think studying is, is really important, and the more looks you get, uh, the better off your jiu-jitsu is going to be. So if you only get a look of one training partner, because you know that person's safe, they're never going to hurt you, your jiu-jitsu is basically limited to how it works against that one person. You know, but you know, there's four of you around this table right now, and all of you have different jiu-jitsu. All of you have a different game. All of you have a different skill set. And why would I want to deprive myself of, of experiencing any one of those, even if maybe one day it's me testing my jiu-jitsu against you, and maybe the, another day it's me letting you test your jiu-jitsu against my defenses? You know, I mean, it just depends. But, um, you know, I think being selective is important. The older I get, the more selective I am, um, you know, as far as, especially on the first couple rolls when I'm cold, you know, I tend to I tend to pick guys that I know are, are going to make safe movements with me. You know, uh, they're not they're not gonna they're not people that are going to be like making fast jerky, you know, crazy movements. They're going to roll well. Um, but once I'm warm, I like to roll with everybody. I was going to say we noticed that this weekend uh, you guys rolled with everybody and anybody who wanted to and. Uh, we were talking about that at lunch. That's what made the seminar so great. You know, we've all been to seminars before, but, you know, where there wasn't a lot of rolling. But you guys were out with everybody, and, and that was one of the big takeaways I got from everybody in attendance. Tim Tim rolled more than I did. I did roll with a lot of people. Um, he was talking about how guilty he felt having to tell somebody no, and um, I, had, I had told one person no this weekend as well, and it was just the, the similar situation, the end of the training, and my body was... Uh, you know, I haven't been training really hard lately, and I was just felt like, it, for my own benefit, it was best to just call it. And I, I never want to say no, A, because, um, as Tim says, we're service providers. That's what we're doing. Uh, and then also, it's the ego. Like, I, I never want to tell somebody no. I want to give them that role. I'm not running from anybody. I'm running towards the tough people. I, I love the challenge. And um, anyways, it, it, was, it was great to roll with everybody. There's a lot, a lot of talented practitioners here. Um, one, one of the ways, we're talking about, like, Picking training partners, or maybe he was uh, Tim was talking about somebody, you know, may not roll with somebody because they're having trouble with them and they're avoiding them, and a good coach will step in and help. Um, and, and that, and it, it reminded me of some of the things that I do. I, I think about a lot of the guys that have been with me a long time, and they give me trouble. And um, there's a guy, Jacob Robinson. He has a really good hook sweep. He's like about the same height as me, and um, his hook sweep is just. It, it, it's, you know, every, some people just have that move, and his hook sweep is just amazing. And so. Um, I've broken that hook sweep down, and 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 all, there's a ton of layers on how to deal with it. And the the most important thing is like you try to get low on him with the hook sweep, you're getting swept because he reaches over your back and grabs your belt. 
So you have to pass his hook sweep standing. That's no easy feat. I, I get swept a lot by him. But that's the physical chess that uh, one of my coaches used to always talk about. I mean, it's it's a challenge. I want to deal with his hook sweep. It's so good. I got another guy, Matt Ferris, extremely strong, talented grappler. And um, I can only give him hard rolls when I when I go after him like it's a tournament you know if, if he's just way stronger than me he's like an oil and water mix like what my game doesn't gel with him at all you know so like if I like slap myself in the face and like talk some trash to him and get him wound up and go after him like I can win the round I can I'm not saying I always will but that's the only way you know like so like there's there's this that that was the that's the only formula I found that worked for me. I can't slow play him. I've got to jump on him and not give him a chance. And uh, there's no guarantee in that. But each person has a certain attribute that meshes against you poorly, and you can you got to take that. And instead of just going like, oh man, there's nothing I can do about it, or he's just better than me. It's like no, there's. Uh, I think Tim said like there's no magic. It's all leverage, and uh, that that's what it is. Like there's there's a way to deal with this. There's a way to beat it. And um, oftentimes to, to figure out how to do it, because I can't always deduce the right answer. I'm just like, crap, it happened again. You know, like it happened again. What's the answer? You know, oh, I kept getting an underhook on Tim. He chokes me with a guillotine. Like, well, maybe I shouldn't play so tight. Maybe I shouldn't put my head into his belly. Maybe I should play like more open guard or whatever. Um, one of the things that I do is, you know, I bring instructors into my school, but I'll bring my coach, Pimenta, uh, Dennison Pimenta, and I will wa- watch him with my students. Because they're gonna they're gonna throw their A game on him too, and that to, you know I train my guys. We train, we go after each other. There's no hierarchy, and you're not scared about hurting feelings and stuff. And uh, but I'll watch Pimenta beat these guys, and there's a way he's doing it. It's not just that he's physically so much stronger; he's moving them, but he's shutting down that game, and that's the blueprint. So there I am taking mental notes of like I see what he's doing, and you know Pimenta passes the butterfly guard standing. He doesn't drop. He, he's never on his knees. So. Um, Anyways, that I think I think that's the fun part is those people that are giving you trouble because when you do figure out how to beat their A game, that's such a reward. You know, you still have to deal with the rest of their game, but like they, that's the chess, that's the challenge. I was talking to Tim about that. Like that's the thing that I love. I love to be challenged. I love for my friends to challenge me. Like personally, you know, I like to be challenged in business to be better and on the mat. Like those good guys, that's that's the opportunity. You know, all, all this kind of splintered off of a uh, dripped pizza sauce onto my wife's lap <laughs> and, but yeah it, it's interesting that all the, the the points you bring up about you know choosing your trading partners as a positive thing as a negative thing helping coaches uh coaches helping see that and deal with that and uh and not avoiding people's strong games as training partners as you know that could be a huge mistake sure it's fun to win the round but if if I could, you know, if you could put me in a footlock and I could take apart the vice grip that's on my legs and, and get up, that's a huge, you know, a lot of skill that I've had to develop, you know, with your help to do that versus if I just try to avoid the whole thing altogether. And, and just the whole thing of, of you know, you, it's not a individual thing. You're using your whole team as you as you get better at jujitsu. Uh, I, I, one of the things that I admire my coach about is um, he'll take, uh, you know, everybody's got their thing. He will let them start with their grips, not to, to be arrogant, but if he can get kind of deep into the rabbit hole and get out of it, which he normally does, but like then when he's in a match, if he gets out of position, like he's tra- like, he has seen that before. Like, oh, you play Baron Bolo. He'll let, like, I got a purple belt with a really good Baron Bolo and great grips. He'll let them have everything. And they'll just shut it down. But instead of like passing his guard, mounting him and cross choking him like he does everybody else, he'll pass his guard and then he'll get right back into his guard and he'll let him get the grips. And he'll you know, he'll do that with me. He knows I'm shooting for one leg X and he'll let me try. And he's just he's just shutting it down. So I mean I have a real like, you know, I'm not really great at a lot of things at jujitsu, but I'm really good at one leg X. You know, and so he's He's training with you know me, and that's the like one area where I can help him, and he's utilizing it. He's not running from that position. He's just he's using me as a drilling partner. I'm rolling, and he's drilling, and I think that's a really good way to roll with people that maybe aren't as good as you is to let them get started into some good stuff, um, and then work out of it. You know, and you can. I mean, that's just the, you know what Tim was saying. Being in the moment, that's like, you're not just going and having a roll. 
you know, there's an objective. There's a clear objective that I'm trying to get the most out of my time, our finite time. And uh, I, I think that's, you know, I hope that people that are listening to this come away with, so, you know, these, these conversations that, you know, we're having, they're, these are conversations based around 20 years a piece of experience. And, and if you're listening to this podcast, you're able to like get some insight that you can apply, even if you don't have much faith in our, our, you know, our experiences, like you can apply this and get ahead of the curve and get so much more out of your, um, out of your journey and your time. You can get so much more out of your time. Yeah. That training methodology is brilliant. Really. There's not very many other sports where, I mean, I couldn't go up to an NBA player and we couldn't play one-on-one and he would get nothing out of it. But we're sitting here at a table with three black belts and y'all could roll with blue belts and you can get something out of it. They gain from the role, you gain from the role, everybody's better because of it. And I think that's unique to jujitsu, and I love it. And uh, full disclosure, I keep looking back because at some point I'm leaving for the airport and I just... You know, I, I don't want to be the guy holding everybody up. So if, if, if I just disappear off the podcast, you know, I've got to catch my flight back to Little Rock. And um, the honeymoon's going to be over soon for me. <laughs> I, I do want to talk a little bit about your guys' seminars. And you, you, there's two seminars that were quite a bit different. Uh, really showed his leg lock system, um, or part of it anyway. And, and, and Tim talked about pressure uh, from top side and but there was a, a large overall theme that that I got that I don't always get with seminars is that both you guys really cared about the students that and it, it, I hate to say it not all seminars are that way sometimes you, the, the guy shows up collects a check and, and signs takes some pictures and gets out of there do not even take pictures like, but you guys wanted us to get the stuff right you, you guys you know wanted to take the time and work with us individually uh, as you went around and, and it really just that the feeling that you guys are here for the students and that's what and so uh, <laughs> they, they went on Saturday Sunday was uh, I taught some stuff hard acts to follow but I kept telling myself I just want the students to get the best that I could give them whatever that is today with what I have in my ability I, I want to be here and I want to give them give them my best and I didn't nobody complained so <laughs> but um, that that was a common theme which I would be having such a big name list of names to choose from to, to, to think about bringing in for the for this like we hit the two. We found the two right guys, like Thank guys you. that care about the students and have the knowledge to to share. Yeah, I think. Any, I mean, uh, maybe it's I, like I, I think I told the students yesterday that I've stood in front of um, rooms where I've taught the exact same workshop and I've wanted praise from it. You know, the reason that I wanted to do the best I could do is because I wanted people to think. Uh, highly of my jujitsu or my instructing ability and I wanted to pad my ego and pad my uh, self-worth with what people's opinions were of me and I've had a big life transition you know um, and I've got a new perspective and uh, yesterday it wasn't about me Um, you know I'm going to give my best all the time it's what are the motivations behind me giving my best and um to be the best instructor i can be i needed to make sure that i uh organized that material disseminated that material and then checked and evaluated how everybody was absorbing the material so that everybody who came who paid hard-earned money to be with me on the mats um, got the most value out of it that can possibly get and value that continues to just in, uh, to keep moving forward. And, it, and so I was, uh, you know, um, Rolly and I have been having a lot of talk, com- great conversations this weekend. One of them is on that we are service providers. And I really, I really viewed that. My, my job this weekend wasn't, you know, to come in and uh, have anybody pat me on the back for how well I did or, you know, how tough I may be. Or, you know, I, of course, I love to hear people say, oh, that was some great pressure, right? Especially when that's what I'm teaching. I, I wanted it, I wanted it to, to, to sell. But I wanted it to sell because I wanted people to say, yeah, the money that I spent on this camp was well worth it because I got to feel it. I got to see it. I got to learn it. The guy that was teaching it to me cared about me knowing it. And 
that way they benef- they maximize the benefit from it. Um, so uh, I think anybody who comes in to teach a seminar and doesn't have the audience and their best interests in mind is just operating from a position of of probably thinking they're worth more than what they are because not only is not only is our time on the mat finite uh, our marketability of ourselves is finite i mean you look at the you look at who were the top names in the late 90s early 2000s for jiu-jitsu seminars in the united states Rolly and i can we can we could name these people who everybody would go do a seminar with right now those guys can't book seminars today yeah it's true so it's so I would rather build relationships that are meaningful um, and and come share as much as I can share while I can share it and have somebody go into class later. You know, maybe maybe it's uh, somebody who travels out of class and they, they grab a white belt and the white belt says, oh, man, I can't breathe. And the person remembers me and says, <laughs> I learned that from Tim. You know, long after I'm off the mat, if, if something like that, that's where everlasting jiu-jitsu life comes from, is what ripple effect did I cause. So. Did, was it you, Tim, that said, or did I read that somewhere else? Oh, no, I read it somewhere else. Uh, Black Belt Elliot Marshall posted on Facebook or Instagram, probably both. You know, uh, it was a quote he, he reposted, but, you know, the, we die two deaths. The day we die, and then the day the last person we touched died. You know, and I was like, that's... It's just sick. You know... The more you learn about life, the simpler it gets. Like the, the everything echoes from something else, and the things that I do in business. Um, I'm reading a real estate book right now, and it's like the whole first like part of it. I'm like, geez, like I, th- I think it's talking about jujitsu. You know, I think it's talking about that. You know, and the truth is truth. Human nature is human nature, and um, you know our our value systems are our value systems. And, and Tim nailed it. Like we're just trying to create meaningful relationships. That's what. I, I, you know, some people think I've had some success in, um, you know, martial arts, and I, I don't see it the same way. You know, like I, I always look at what I didn't do, not um, some of the things that I did have an opportunity to do. And so when I do look back, and you know, like I have some pictures from, you know, doing Bellator or the UFC. Well, I don't look back at those. I, I never look back at them. What I think about is, oh, I met Nathan Leverton, the coach of the guy who knocked me out in England. And became really good friends with him and learned some great things from him, you know. And and, and uh, I think about, oh, I ended up doing a seminar because I fought in the UFC in Connecticut. And I met some really great people up there that I'm still close to. That's what I remember. And that's not like just some feel-good crap for the podcast. That's legit. Like, that's what I value. There's people that I can, you know, um, Tim was saying, we can go anywhere in the country, Tim and I. And we're going to have a couch to to surf on and a mat to, you know, if we need to make some money, we can go make some money. If we want to just teach a class, we can go teach a class. Like if we need someone to show us where all the high happening spots of that city are, someone will be happy to do so. And I've had those experiences all over the world. And that's the value. That's the game right there. I'm not back here for leg locks. You guys have dozens of people that you could bring in for leg locks. I'm back here because we've created relationships that's you know so like it, it's almost self-serving like be a good person build good relationships and the rest will take care of itself uh, you know I guess that's all I need to say about it but that that for me I can tell you I don't look back and look at old medals and I don't have a lot of old medals um, or go back and look at like any of these milestones people think oh it's so cool you fought in the UFC like for me it was like yeah I, I was fortunate I was lucky I was in the right place at the right time there were plenty of people out there more deserving than me you know, and, and the win I get in the UFC, well, a lot of that has to do with the matchup. It's luck, man. Like, so much of it's out of our control. So I don't hold on to that stuff, but I think about all the people I met, and then there's no, I can't talk my way out of that. No, I met that person. I really like them. They seem to really like me. We enjoy each other's company. That's the true value system, you know? So, uh, Byron gave us some show notes here, and uh, typically in the podcast, he emails them to us, and uh, we've got some topics to discuss, and on the show notes, it's uh, stuff from Tim and stuff from Rolly, who just <laughs> fell off his chair. <laughs> we have it's not a chair, really. Wait, no, that was a guard pull, Joe. <laughs> okay, well, well, we have we haven't provided very good seating for our guests, and they're doing the best with it. <laughs> so I'll, I'll go first, and I'll just I'll just give a, a couple of thoughts on on both guys. Um, first off, Tim, I want to say that. 
I thought the first 10 or 15 minutes that you brought were worth the seminar. Uh, Tim came and he talked about how to get the most out of seminars, the value of taking notes, the value of coming prepared. And uh, he's talked on this podcast about being a service provider. And you got that feeling right away that he was there to make sure we got the most out of it. And I really appreciate that. As far as the techniques go, I really like that you had uh, uh, pressure and then a submission that resulted from their reaction. And that's just really good jujitsu, and I really appreciate that. Uh, Roly, uh, one of the things I really appreciate about what he brought was, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, because this is more of an impression I got than things that you actually said, but there's a lot of fine details to finishing a footlock, and you need to learn those and perfect them. But you need to first learn how to isolate the leg, how to put the leg in a compromising position. And, and so the learning process really should be started from that end and moving towards the finish. And I really appreciated that. And, uh, and I appreciate it. I'll just go back to what we talked about at the beginning of watching you guys interact. Byron, Jake Fox, we had black belts on the mats during this. And egos don't always just automatically go away when you hit brown or black belt. But in this case, there were no egos on the mat. Uh, there were insightful questions that you guys asked each other, comments during the seminars, and I appreciated that more than you guys can ever know. Man, you appreciate it. We appreciated it. You know, it was. It's just. Um, it's just what it is, man. It's why. That's that not everybody stays in the sport for a long time, but that's that's what it is. I think we're. Um, I mean, Tim, Tim's uh, uh, an attorney by trade, and um, you know we. we and, and, and I myself, like, you know, I have a lot of other opportunities. Like, it's a choice to do jujitsu. It's not, we're not stuck in, like, oh, well, this is just what we do. This is the only way that I can make a living. Well, you know, I, I can make a living a hundred different ways, um, but I choose to do this because I love jujitsu. And, and again, I love the community that I get from it. I love being around my students and I love doing things like this and meeting great people. Um, so, I, man, I know I, I can speak for Tim as well. We appreciate you um, complimenting us on that, but that's, um, you know, he's asking, you know, we're asking each other insightful questions because we want to know, we want to understand, you know. Yeah, it was very obvious you guys were as eager to learn as you guys were to bring information to us. It was a beautiful thing to watch. Gary, what'd you think? Well, you know, first of all, it was incredible. Um, but I'll, I'll start with Tim. Um, I'm kind of with Joe there. What I really liked is your, your talk right off the bat, you know, really just got us motivated. But I love, you can see that you really did care. You know, he actually put together a, a bullet points a, a timeline of what we were going to go through. And I, after it was done, I've, I've wrote that, you know, the whole thing's just filled with my notes. I'm not going to forget it because he provided a piece of paper with a timeline. That just shows how much you really cared. Uh, the other thing you did, Tim, I've never had this done before, is after we were done and we were eating dinner right over here you actually asked me what i got out of it um what maybe could have you done better i've never had that done before to me you know that really impressed me and like i told you it's a lot of little things that i'm not a big pressure guy i play loose i'm uh but that is the weakness of my game and you know little things like you know active toes is something i'm gonna have to look work on and just your four bullet points of creating pressure you know flaring the elbows and and uh, flat back those are things that i'm going to use it's going to go through my head it's going to turn my game around so i really appreciate all that roly my third seminar with you uh, the one thing it makes me feel special, the minute I walk in, Roley comes over and says hi to me. Like I said, you guys are superstars to me, uh, guys I look up to. Um, you know, who am I that you're going to remember me? But you just talked all about that. You know, you, you care about, more about relationships. And it, But this is my third leg lock seminar I've been with Roley. And somebody could say to me, hey, why are you doing this leg lock seminar? Not only have I done three leg lock seminars, I have this app. Why are you, you know, what else can you learn? Like you said, right off the bat, Rolly, I, I've, you're always, your game's always evolving. You're always getting better. I have never seen the slap the knee to catch, you know, the back of the toes. I have never seen that before. And just that was one thing I always had trouble with is getting in the right spot to get the toes. And that little just slap 
and then catch such a great detail. big difference in the world and you know what you guys just were talking about that you guys are service providers you're spot on you guys really care it showed i you know i don't even care about what i learned this weekend i care about i think i made met two great people you know what i learned this weekend is going to make me that much better but it all comes down to i met two good people and you know even if i learned nothing i could care less because I had a great time, but I learned a lot. My game is going to get better, and thank you guys so much. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to go home feeling good. I know, right? <laughs> I, um, I'm going to have to dip out now, guys. I'm, I'm having a, a ton of fun. Um, doing, I actually really enjoy doing podcasts because I'm an extrovert, so I get fuel from being around people. I just It just brings me up, and um, I admire like introverts that are like can go be alone and read a book because like, there's a lot of that that I need to be doing, and... Um, but yeah, I'm. Uh, anyways, to, to say that I'm, I'm you know, I, I hate that I have to leave because I'm having so much fun chatting it up. Uh, I just want to make one point. Um, you were talking about uh, the detail that you hadn't seen. Um, one of the problems that we have in society right now is everybody knows a little bit about everything and they really don't know crap about anything. You know, there's no depth. And so uh, in jujitsu, it's um, I don't like the collegial approach of just knowing a little bit about everything. I think you should find an area of the game that comes natural to you and then find the resources to support that and then grow from there. Um, that, that's my opinion on, on how to learn jujitsu. Uh, if you're liking ankle locks, then you need to go down that rabbit hole and you need some frequency. Um, you don't need to go work with somebody. If you like my system, you don't need to go play double outside. Um, Ashi, like that's because you're going to go do that and then you're not going to get any depth in any one, you know, you just, just feet are going to be confused. I don't know. Do I tuck them in? Do I tuck them out? Do I read? But you don't know what to do. Um, I, I spend a lot of time bringing the same people into my gyms because I like their principles and their fundamentals and I want that frequency. So, um, to, to, you know, you obviously got some stuff out of the seminar. It is continuing to evolve, but even if it was the same exact seminar, but it was me in person, I think, um, that type of learning is really, really important. And, uh, I, I think we need more depth of knowledge and uh, that's why, like, I know how to do a leg drag, like more or less, but I ask specific questions about the leg drag because I need, I need a deeper knowledge of the leg drag. I'm not very comfortable teaching the leg drag because I only – so what happens is you teach the move. Yeah, I know the move. And then there's a follow-up question. And I like to know the answer to what I teach. You know, But you, you need to know the, the movements pretty well. And, of course, with experience, you, if somebody presents a question, you can, um, you can, with deductive reasoning, figure out a, a pretty good answer. But I want to know uh, a simple move like a leg drag better. And so that's why I was asking the questions to learn it. Um, anyways, I've got to run. And thank you so much, Tim. Obviously, I uh, had a great time with you this oh, weekend, it's man. A blessing. Yeah, sure. it's been awesome. And the rest of you guys, thanks so much. Um, it, it was an honor to be here. Um, I really enjoy being on the podcast. Um, I pitched uh, one of my students to, to be on the podcast as well. I thought he had kind of a unique position. Um, that a lot of people could relate to. And so I'm looking forward to seeing how that plays out. Um, and yeah, uh, you guys have a great cool. day. Thanks, right. Thank you, Rolly. See you, man. Great time training with you, Rolly. Safe travel. Okay. We'll be in touch. Okay, brother. Thank you. So now that Rolly's gone, <laughs> I'll, uh, I, I, I liked, and he can't talk about it anymore, but he talked, to, of course, his, his detail and explanation of leg locks is, is amazing and it's taken me a few times to pick it up. I think I'm getting more confidence. I need to just train it when I get home or when, you know, a week later. But uh, he talked about uh, dealing with a loss. He talked to us about several losses that he had, but he, he talked about, you know, doing a tournament and losing and then how he went back and said, how could I do this differently? This guy had a real flexible leg. How am I going to address that? And, and you, you know, you hear the thing. Sometimes you win, sometimes you learn. But most people don't actually practice that. He went home and he changed what he was doing in order to uh, better his jiu-jitsu. I thought that was really neat, uh, just the conversation. Um, and, and Tim, I, you know... The detail was good. The pressure was was really interesting to learn. Uh, I think the pressure was different than than most of the pressure I had thought or I had experienced before. The 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 lock and key. I thought I found that particularly interesting. Having felt it from you as uh, you demoed it, I was like, well, that's different. 
because I'm used to the uh, squeeze the ribs and push down on the ribs, mm-hmm. and and really you're getting underneath the ribs at mm-hmm. that point. And uh, I thought that was uh, probably the most like making me think about pressure differently uh, portion of of what you taught. And then like I think Gary mentioned it a few minutes ago, you you ask a lot of people, hey, let me know what you thought. I'd like to hear if you have anything that I could improve upon. Mm-hmm. And that's what we do in jiu-jitsu, except for you get tapped. <laughs> that you can prove upon that because you got tapped by that. And uh, I was like, I don't, I can't think of anything. But that's a, that's like a generic response that people give. Uh, not to give you uh, that feedback on the podcast now, but I was thinking, well, what could he have done differently? Like, what really? And, and yeah, I welcome it. And you Bring it. and you did. Uh, you, you you walked around the room. You talked to a lot of people. You helped everybody. But uh, being the uh, the the person who was getting the technique demonstrated on them. I got a different experience than other people. Mm. And with the lock and key example uh, of, of really, uh, his ribs are going underneath my ribs and pushing on my lungs is what it feels like. And I don't know how many of the people who partner off get that experience because they're just, they're just kind of working on it. But when, but when you did that, it was almost like you just, you took your, the blade of your hand and you just stuck it underneath my ribs. Like, whoa, that's different. And I, and I think the more students that you get to feel that, and it's not scary. It's not, a, it's not like he's going to break my ribs pressure. It's like, well, that's different. And I think the more people that you get to actually feel that from you, I think that that would, would make them say, oh, I don't quite have the pressure right. Right. Because it is different. <laughs> right. And it's hard to do. It's, it's not a thing that just, it, you slide it, you know, you get that pressure pretty much like, like it's been doing it for years because right, you right. have but for two people to pair off and to figure out how to do that that's kind of tricky sure and I and it was you know as long as I've been doing jujitsu, I've never experienced that that not necessarily degree of pressure but that angle or, or that type of pressure was mm-hmm. different than what I've experienced which great was feedback cool. yeah I'll, I'll note that make Smash sure more students basically yeah, yeah. no and I think and I think there's a there's a huge value to that you know and um it's it's very it's duly noted because that is something where you can put a lot of pressure on somebody and not have the exact pressure that I'm trying to to sell and so you need to feel what I'm trying to sell yeah. and I think that that's a that's a great that's great feedback because I do try to circle around I do try to go around and make sure people are doing it well and I'm asking them a lot of questions but you that's a uh, uh, great feedback I welcome it uh, but yeah uh, great instruction and uh, I look forward to to adding pressure to my game <laughs> even more so I, I do like Gary does play a, a game where he, he'll pass and he's trying to catch the arm he's trying to and he, he does a very good job of that but I pass and I want to stay there for a little while and, and deprive them of some oxygen as you say and uh, and work on that a bit and well actually you know I, I play a different game but one thing you were talking about is you you deprive people of oxygen they're going to make mistakes you talked about how we keep people from breathing and uh, you went over that and that was one thing that was making me think I really have to work on this it'll make me that much better just your explanation of breathing and how you're going to constrict my breathing I've never really had anybody really go into that I always would say hey he's constricting my breathing because he's smashing me but you made some good points when I'm on the side even if I'm smashing the front I can breathe out the back, you know, so I need to flatten you out. I'm, you know, you can't expand your lungs. And, uh, you know, I just never really heard it explained like that, and it made made great sense to me. Uh, uh, Rolly mentioned it a little bit ago. I have a, I have a really common saying that I say a lot, that uh, jiu-jitsu is mechanics, not magic. Um, and, you know, uh, he, he used, he's taken that into sort of how he problem solves. Um, and the other thing I always try to do is how to make the how to make the moves more efficient, how to make the moves um, cleaner. Um, is is all just about understanding the mechanics of the move and it moves and pressure. Um, those you take those four principles that I talked about. Um, you can apply those across the spectrum. You know, in any combination that you want, and the whole goal is just as you said is to try to drive somebody into uh, oxygen depletion uh, while you're in surplus and pressure is just a great way to do that so you know we do a lot of things in this show that are not just straight up jujitsu 
I'd like to have fun. Yeah, most of the time they're playing jokes on me, Tim. <laughs> that, that being said, it yeah. happens every time. <laughs> you probably already planned one. Have you it, enjoyed the weekend free of getting uh, jokes played on you? So this basically means they've been playing a joke on me all weekend, and I'm just finally figuring it out. They're going to tell us about it, and I have no clue. And uh, as usual, let's pick on the old guy. Bunch of bullies. It is a bit of picking on the old guy. Um, I want to thank our Patreon supporters for helping support the podcast. Uh, our newest Patreon supporters are Trip and Caleb. And I want to give a special shout-out to Mindy, who was in attendance at the seminar. That was awesome to, to trade with Mindy. It was great to meet you, Mindy. Thank you so much for coming. And another shout-out to Adrian, who uh, donated some money to us on Patreon or on uh, through PayPal. So thank you, guys. Uh, now, if you're thinking about helping us out on Patreon, we'll send you out a 5-inch BJ Brick Gee Patch. We'll send you out a sticker. As like tokens of appreciation, because what you largely do is donate like a dollar per episode, and it really helps us keep going and and, and helps the show uh, build to to a bigger and better uh, show that we can produce. Now, past Patreon supporters uh, have have really saved the show at sometimes, but future ones are going to get a special treat because I'm getting a little nervous, Tim. Gary was nice enough to do a little modeling for us, and we've got these beautiful pictures. Oh, man, that's nice. They're going to be getting an autographed picture what of, do you think, Gary? of Gary. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Glamour shots, baby. <laughs> Boy, that's a good-looking 51-year-old there. <laughs> and even one of them has him in a gi. So what Gary's going to do... Whoa. Oh, you even got me in a gi. Dang. Start signing them, brother. So we're going to have Gary sign these pictures, and he's a good sport, so he'll do it. So the next uh, several Patreon supporters will... Uh, it, you know, it's super cheap to mail things. That's the thing. As long as it fits in the envelope, like a, like a gi patch or like a sticker, it's good to go. If we gave away T-shirts, it would be a lot bigger deal. I'd have to go to the post office and figure out postage and all that sort of thing. And But uh, I can slip a picture that Gary has autographed into any envelope and send it anywhere around the world. It's going to go to our Patreon supporters. I think you could mail this just like a uh, postcard. <laughs> and then and we have a lot more inadvertent you know, eyes on this. I, I think if you mailed that as a postcard, I think it would never make its destination. Somebody, think somebody would steal somebody that. Would steal it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if it would pass the federal porn statutes. <laughs> Those are hot. <laughs> so we'll put a, a link. We'll put a, a couple of these. We'll, we'll put uh, some pictures of these uh, autographed pictures of Gary. And just so to entice you to, to join Patreon. You know, I'm going to start my own podcast where nobody <laughs> makes fun of me. <laughs> well, we can never hey, this is good, though. I, I, you guys, this might be one of your better ones. This is good. Well, I'm glad you appreciate it, Gary. Because uh, there's probably another one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we got to get you signing some, some stuff, so that's, that's good. Oh, he's really, he's putting more of his name on there, so. You guys could enjoy the whole personal yeah, I don't know what you, you wrote a lot just, of stuff. You know, talking with Tim, I take this, uh, you know, I'm a service provider. There you Taking go. This serious. <laughs> not like you guys. That's true. I, I'm not yeah, autographing I'm, anything. I'm wearing a tie right now. <laughs> <laughs> Where? <laughs> <laughs> Man. Now you guys got Tim in on this. <laughs> yeah. He's an assassin. Uh, I want to let you guys know about next week and a couple weeks in advance. Uh, next uh, week we'll have. Uh, I get those switched. No, next week we have Brian Freeman. He's been on the show a couple times. He came to Wichita. Uh, Brian has a spinal cord injury. He's paralyzed. Uh, his legs are paralyzed. And I got to to roll with him and train with him and, and take him took him over to my house and we did an uh, interview. And so uh, look for that next week. The week after that, uh, Joe did an interview with Seth Daniels. Yeah, that was a great interview. Uh, if you're not familiar with Seth Daniels, he's the uh, CEO of Fight to Win Pro. It was a really great interview. If you're worried it's a 50-minute promotion for Seth's uh, business there, it's not. He's been doing martial arts since he was three years old. He's got a black belt in judo and a black belt in BJJ. And uh, so tune in and catch that one for sure. Yep, and then the week after that, the episode 253, we have the interview with Rafael Lovato Sr. I can't wait to catch that one. He's a, he's a, an unknown or a little-known legend, um, one of the old-school 
American jiu-jitsu practitioners who uh, put in the miles, put in the miles with this little boy who turned into uh, an American black belt, uh, just phenom. Um, and so I can't wait to hear what you guys talked about or talk about because I'm ready to learn from him. Yeah, that was one of those interviews when I got done. Uh, I texted my wife. I had an amazing interview. I was really excited. And, and at the end of the interview, I said, hey, we got to get you back on. And he, he said that he enjoyed the experience and we'll be happy to come on again. So uh, he'll, hopefully he'll be a, a regular, semi, you know, I said, we'll get you on in about a year or so. We'll, and that's kind of what we do with a lot of our uh, repeat guests. We let a little time pass. But he could he could share his knowledge for, for days on the podcast. But anyway, this has been a fun episode, episode 250 in the books. Uh, we recorded it together. There was five the five amigos this time. Uh, oh, the four amigos, because it <laughs> seems like you guys don't like me. <laughs> but anyway, stay sweaty, my friends. And don't forget to shower. Train hard, train smart, get better. We'll see you on the mats, guys. Thank you for listening. I hope you find the time today to roll. After all, the best way to get better at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is to do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu.